Welcome to the Roll Wise Podcast. My name is Mike, and I'm here with my good friend Brent. Say hi, Brent. Hello, everybody. It's been a couple of weeks since we were actually last able to record an episode, mostly due to those pesky holiday things. So we hope everybody had a, uh, a good little bit of time off. I know our episodes are a little bit a uh, little bit longer, so give you a recharge the battery so you can go ahead and listen to this one. Um, because today we are going to be diving into a little bit of stuff around the block, a little bit of whale watching for that Watsy stuff, as and uh, kind of hitting those cyberpunk games that we thought we'd talk about last time we did this. So Brent, are you ready to uh, ready to to watch the white whale and see what they do, or or what? Yeah, let's uh, let's go. Let's get into it. Should be interesting. Yeah. So now I I don't know if you are are like me and you sometimes read slight snippets of like investor reporting and all that kind of stuff. But did you see all the the hubbub about Hasbro in the last week or two? I have heard that there's some concern that Hasbro is uh, like losing money hand over fist and they're not sure why. Well, well, I think people know why. Um, I mean, the the main reason why is because Hasbro has created this, at least the the main reason that I've seen explained by people that are in the know is that Hasbro is losing money because of Magic the Gathering. Like they have releases on a, on a nearly weekly basis of new cards for command decks and all this shit. And, and don't get me wrong, people that are listening right now, um, if anybody were to like say, hey, Mike, do you know how to play Magic the Gathering in 2022? I would say, fuck no. I have no idea. Like I don't even know. Like when they say commander decks, I just have this vague assumption that that means that there's like some sort of leader card that's your commander but past that i wouldn't have a fucking clue how to play in a modern tournament i would show up clueless and out and be knocked out the first round uh i would say i wouldn't play in a mod that game is way too competitive for me um but i have played magic in the past and i have probably spent an, an exorbitant amount of money on magic cards oh, yeah. in history so um yeah, yeah. I don't remember when I stopped playing, but I stopped. Pl- I I played for a long time. You know, I mean, I I was playing in back in the day because obviously because we're like to date ourselves and those of our listeners that want to get back in that good old nostalgia days goes. Remember those days when you could walk into a card shop and you'd still see black lotuses for under two hundred bucks? Yeah, those were the days. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was playing back in. Um, I think it was revised is when I started playing. You know the revised edition, and then I uh, yeah, that's years. when I that's when I started playing too. I was playing when there was like only two expansions, yeah. Um, and that yes, that does make me old. But like yeah, there's no way I would know what to do with a, a magic game now. That doesn't mean that I couldn't pick it up though. But yeah, no, no magic is one of those things. I just wouldn't want to. Like like, and oof. I think that what I was seeing is that like, and so the <laughs> the article that I read and some of the YouTubers that I watched kind of commented on it. It was. You know, they were talking about, first of all, there's like an overprinting of cards. Like as a, as a collector, you can't keep up with the number of decks that are being released on the regular. Like, so you, you're, you're, I mean, could you buy a new set every week? The answer is typically no. Right? And if you're trying, you're, you're probably stealing TVs like a crack addict. Like you're well, probably, exactly. you're probably like, I need to break into this house to get funds to support my card habit. Your, your card habit it's a, diff- <laughs> it's a different kind of crack but it's true i mean like you know magic is an expensive hobby and i think that the people at hasbro probably you know the once they they got that popularity and all that kind of stuff because because there's like the game is designed for in person but it's also designed for a you know kind of an online arena type thing you know they think they do a lot of online gameplay now but i mean it's my understanding is that you know they kind of like they've made some tactical errors there's no like scarcity to it anymore so yeah. like you know they, they're they kind of the first of all and I, and i'm and anybody that's a magic the gather gathering person like you can you can of course email us or comment on our socials and say like mike's take on this was wrong and he misinterpreted the entire thing that's fine i would love to know the true story because at least you know i have a, a passing interest in it from my history with it but it's my understanding is first of all they print too many cards so you can't buy them all so there's no scarcity they're reprinting cards, so they're you know taking the things that were scarce <laughs> and making them right. less valuable and making it hard for people to tell what 
what mm -hmm. is the original card and what's not. That's always bad. Yeah, so they're doing a little bit of that. You know, they they aren't bringing back the grand tournaments like they used to have because those were you know when I was playing those were really cool. Like even some of the people back when I was at my local card sh you know show went to like the regional type stuff in an effort to you know, get into those grand tournaments and stuff like that. And uh, I never really had the money or the desire to do it, but I, I always thought that was really neat that they would go and play these, you know, decks and see how they did. And then uh, lastly, you know, they, you know, they kind of just seem to be giving their, uh, their customers the finger because, you know, they did a, a, an addition, an anniversary edition pack that was basically reprints of the original cards, but they were in, they were not, like able to be played with because they had like all these variations on them like they had the, the back was wrong and like all this other stuff right. so it's just like there's just like this misstep after misstep in terms of like you know giving the community and the, and the game players what they want and being able to kind of build up to you know build it, up it, to suffers, it, it suffers somewhat and and people are going to call me a hypocrite when i talk about buying cards being cracked when people realize that i play warhammer 40k um uh I would say it's easier to chase the meta in cards, though, because it's easier. To, it feels like it's easier to put down that money for cards than it is to buy 40k things. But what I would say is, um, it's like anything. Like I think sometimes what happens is like people who start running a business don't know anything about the game, and so they make these decisions that um, that impact the game in ways that they don't they don't understand. And I think that's probably one of the things that's happening. And a little anecdote for you. I can tell you the exact moment that I decided I was never playing Magic again. Uh, oh. I went to a tournament just with a couple of friends. They were playing in it, and um, mm -hmm. I wasn't, but I went with them. And one of the guys that I had done gone with, who actually won the tournament, his whole deck was a blue deck that was basically playing solitaire. Basically, oh. it was controlling the other person, skipping their turn, having multiple turns in a row himself, and then skipping their turn. So mm -hmm. the moment that I realized that you the best way to win the game is to make sure that the other person doesn't play it and that's the type of competitive like atmosphere that you're going to be in that was the moment that i was like yeah magic isn't the game for me like that's not yeah. that's not a game that i want to play because i'm not going to have any fun just sitting there playing, wasting playing with until they playing win. with my playing with playing with myself if you will um yeah. at a tournament that didn't seem uh you know that wasn't the type of that's not the type of game that i want to play um <laughs> So uh, that was the moment I, I could feel out, that, but, but yeah, I, um, I don't actually yeah, think there cool. was like a moment. So do you, was a whimper, you know? do you think that, yeah, you just eventually tra like, ah, I'm just not buying cards anymore. And you just kind of trail off. Yeah. Um, uh, that's kind of how, what, what's happening. 40 K sometimes for me. Um, one of the things, I guess my, my question for you, do you think that the real problem that Hazard was having is, that during COVID, no one could go to those like physical tournaments for Magic, um, you know, during the lockdown and everything. And do you think that's where some of the negative effect is coming in? Is people just got out of the hobby because they stopped playing Magic regularly? You know, it's hard to say. I I would say that you know, like that was probably part of it. Um, but I think they're kind of like, and there may be some bad blood because I, you know, one of your point when they said that people didn't know like how you know, how to run the business had been kind of promoted to positions because, you know, and they're making smart marketing decisions. Um, one of the other things I'd heard is that, like, apparently what, you know, what Hasbro's done inadvertently or not is that they had, um, you know, they had started selling through Amazon, but they had started selling through Amazon at a price that was less than what the comic book store people were buying it at. And oh, so, were, like, yeah, the websites were undercutting the physical stores. Yeah, well, it was it was Amazon was yeah or Am I, Amazon particularly was undercutting yeah it was undercutting the physical, the physical store. store. So like Amazon, you know, if you if a, a a I guess a comic book shop wanted to buy a, a box of X expansion that would cost them, you know, twenty five dollars. I'm just I'm just making up numbers, but Amazon was selling it to the the end user at twenty two, and you're like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and. It, it's, it's weird how common that seems to be because that was something that seemed to be um that also seemed to be that happened with 40k too where mm -hmm. um you could get stuff online at a, at a big discount um from you know like 15 percent of what it was sold in a store mm -hmm. um so yeah. and it's tricky because you know obviously like 
I mean, it, and you know, I think a game like Magic the Gathering probably took a hit from COVID, but it seemed like it's just, it seems like it's got momentum. So I feel like people were playing it online or whatever in that arena format that they were doing. I think that's how people may have gotten their fix and they were having fun and all that. But it seems like if the, if you kill the comic book shop component of it, I, I just feel like people forget that comic book stores are how you get customers a lot of times like because it a community is is like half the battle with most of these games and uh, i mean speaking of community like uh, you can you can see nintendo's master class on how to destroy your community with how they handled this recent smash tournament i don't know if you've ever heard of this mm-hmm. match you know like i i know about I, I know about smash brothers yeah but apparently like there's this community there was like a like an entire community had gotten together and they had like this you know, world world tournament or something like that. It was like the biggest community led event, and they had a license from Nintendo to run it. Well, Nintendo basically said no thanks, and they revoked the license, and they were going to give it to this other company that was going to do these e- this esports deal through Nintendo, kind of like an exclusivity agreement, is my understanding. But mm-hmm. obviously, they basically just spat in their own co- customers and community face. <laughs> <laughs> and said, no, nope, these guys get to do it. You know, and I think that there's just so many situations where it just, it doesn't make any sense to me how these giant corporations that know that, that like, the bottom line is so crucial to how all their calculus and how they run their business. And then they basically go, oh, yeah, customers need to buy our shit after they've made these huge tactical errors. Like, <laughs> well, the the famous quote from a guy that was running GW a few years ago was, uh, we're a model company, not a game company. Um, and that was when they stripped back all the rules out of Age of Sigmar at the time. Like there was like play with whatever models you want. Like there's no points, there's no real rules, and everybody's like, well, how do we play this game? Uh, and they saw a model. The 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 game wasn't popular, and they saw a model the hit and the models being bought because it's it's like sure you guys make excellent models, but you're also a game company. Yeah, like there's a there's a serious lack of awareness. That you have, if you don't think your rules drive yep. drive model sales. Well, and it's and it kind of what what makes it interesting to me, and let's just bring this back to Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, is that I mean, there's there's some of that pressure I think that goes into D and D one, and like how do they make D and D? How do they maintain the the cash cow that D and D is, or has at least become right? Like I mean, well, yeah, and I think that's and I think that's what D and D one is is about is trying to maintain. Like I said, I think my, my I still say this about D and D one. Their real concern that they're that they're going to lose half their customer base again. Um, mm-hmm. Like their real concern that they're going to split the customer base again. Like what happened with Pathfinder and three point five. And I think that's what this is really about. I think this is really about them litmus testing to see is somebody just going to take our rules, fifth edition rules, and make a different game. Make a better game out of it, and and split our and I wouldn't say Pathfinder is better, but split our just split the, you know, split the community in two and basically lose part, yeah, and and lose part because it was like everybody said it wasn't a big deal, but it was when when the switch from three point five to four happened, like there was a big switch to Pathfinder, and it basically made a contender to D and D at the time. Like there, that, those were the two big games at the time. It was Pathfinder and D and D. And those were the two games that you heard all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think they took a big, I think, I think they took a big hit at the time for it and they managed to pull out of it, of course. But I think that's really what this is about is really testing that. Like, yeah. I think that's why the guy said 80% is okay. Cause like, yeah. yeah, we could probably take a 20% hit to our player base, but we don't want to take a, 40 percent like we did before you know okay yeah so so and of course in D D world like we're not gonna we're not really a news channel but you know some of the the whisperings and hearings on is that i think they're putting a lot of a lot of emphasis on making that a successful revenue stream and you can tell by some of the changes in leadership that they've had there you know it, it seems like microsoft is the place to get all of your executives from because now the top <laughs> executives at watsi are all from microsoft i heard like kind of like so, coke and pepsi back in the day it's yeah. like all the executives that got hired everywhere yep you know kind of and, you know like amazon seems to be that new place where you know oh you got amazon in your resume oh an amazon executive is now working at blah so they obviously are there's a truckload of money sir yeah, you you know how to make money, um, and so you know it's it's interesting because I think that you know when you look at like the the main you know runner for D and D, you know he recently got replaced, 
obviously he left it was you know as they say in the news speak it was a you know mutual uh mutual parting amicable you know, amicable separation yeah he, he did everything he wanted to do while i was there and i'm like i don't know if i could work at a company like it and if i if somebody were to say like D and like have your vision for a role-playing game i don't know if if his resume really reflected something that i feel a game designer would be super yeah. happy about especially with you know like at the end when he was starting to get into some of those controversies like you know spell jammer hit hit some notes that people weren't really happy about especially since you know spell jammer a game about flying through you know the astral seas and it <laughs> doesn't have any ship, limited ship combat. limited space space rules yeah yeah that, that's you know that's an add-on expansion you got to pay 29.99 for that um well but, you know, actually honestly actually if they would have said that that probably would have been better than just saying nah it's not in there <laughs> you, um if they would have said it'll cost you an extra twenty dollars for space combat like if they had said there was going to be an expansion um unless i missed something like that probably would have been better than just saying yeah we didn't we just like that <laughs> just, well that but i think maybe you're right maybe that maybe that was the play as they go okay this first book is to give you the expansion give you a very watered down ship to ship combat and give you an adventure to kind of wet your whistle we have a you know slate of books that you can pr- pay for <laughs> that will I mean, expand your experience but that's that's like a that's like a business idea right like here's a taste and we'll we'll you know buy this and then we'll buy a couple other things cuz like yes. cuz like cuz like candy fans will buy anything like, yeah, role, they like role playing book wise, they're like, oh well, I want to play this. I'm not buy this. So, like that would have at least been a plan. Instead, they said, "Fuck it, we're not, we're not having these rules in the book." Um, good luck, well, guys. No, have they, fun making they, it up. They <laughs> said, "Fuck it, we're not going to have these rules in the book." And by the way, have you met our Hadozi race? You know. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. <laughs> I didn't know we wanted to get back into that debacle, but yeah, no, but, did, but I can see why maybe. Well. They might have had a change in leadership, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Like I said, I used to tell people at one of my old jobs, if uh, if the company thinks anything that's going to end them up in the press happens, they're not going to do that. On a, they're not going to they're not going to make that decision. Yeah. So so yeah so they're going to probably put a lot of a lot of emphasis into making one D and D that the cash cow that it's meant to be microtransactions everywhere like unlockables here and there and i and honestly i feel like the more i think about it i think that they're going to move to a kind of a digital first platform where like books are going to be in either a, a like special run or an afterthought like i i just i don't know i feel like and i, and I feel like it's dangerous territory because you know like with with you know the movie like there was i think there were a lot of people that were like oh streaming is gonna you know really be a, a pretty big disruptor but everyone still thought that there were going to be like local movie stores for a period of time right and they just they just evaporated like they just gone <laughs> do you remember hastings well, yeah yeah i know i spent a lot of my formative years in hastings yeah so me too uh so you know it's like you know you go to these places you'd be able that's to like not, go around and <laughs> that's not dating ourselves at all no, As a but, matter of fact, I have boxes of DVDs. I was just trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do with, I'm like coasters. I what? Do, what do you do with DVDs now? Well, you you own them. That's what you do. Because uh, I mean, what happens is is that like, and this is the crazy part, is that first of all, like with you know digital content, you know, like do you actually own the content? Like you know, you you basically have purchase access to it. But what are they? But then what are the, happens when they make errata and stuff like that? Do you have to purchase access to the errata? Do you like? get legacy content like i don't know like i feel like it's gonna it would be it's gonna be much more complicated from a D perspective oh 100 percent, 100 so but but they did uh but you know they are continuing they are trudging forward with their their one D play test and they have released the unearth arcana for um clerics uh, which is which i think they shifted gears a little bit i think they if i remember correctly what they uh said is that they wanted to make the unearth arcana a little bit smaller and less chunky so as opposed to the expert classes where we just kind of got dumped all three expert classes at once they just dumped the clerics this time as opposed to like the clerics paladins and and whatnot but so the other thing that you so the other thing that you don't do on a play test right is you don't you don't you don't change the rules of what you're doing all the time like you keep it consistent (laughs) Um, no. I'm just gonna That's th- antithetical I'm just gonna, to this process. I was gonna throw that out there. Um, like the interview that I watched about this release, when the guy was like, "Um, well, we feel like that people should just use the rules that we already have published, 
if there's nothing in these 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 beta test rules to change that. And it's like, but it doesn't say that anywhere, man. Like you can't just assume that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. So like yeah. So So needless to say, I, I feel like you know, at least with how they explained the clerics and like what they did there, I honestly think the the kind of decisions they made with the clerics made more sense than some of the decisions they made with like the expert classes. Because I feel like you know, with clerics, you know, they, they wanted to, one of the things that I thought was a good call out is that, you know, when you're, when you're first starting D and D, like, like I feel there's, there's two problems. There's like, if you've never played D and D before, then you have to start somewhere. And usually level one is where you start, but you don't want to start with a bunch of shit and a bunch of decisions to make before you even get out of the gate or else you're kind of intimidated by the game. You really just need to have like a character concept. You need to be able to go, do I hit him with a holy? Do I, you're, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do I do here? And then you just kind of move on. Did and they then... really? Did they really fix the? Did they really fix the cleric problem? Which is, what kind of cleric do you want to play? No, you're fucking wrong. You're playing a healer. You're healing. They did actually. They um. Oh, okay. They I I don't know. Maybe you didn't see that, but uh, they actually kind of gave the cleric kind of like um archetypes. Um, and I would I would look it up, but you know, obviously I'm too lazy. I'll look it up later. But but yeah, it's one but of you... them. If one of them's a healer, that's really the only one that they needed to make. Well, is it, it, you, you do make like you do make decisions that kind of like build your character like that. But they wanted to give you like, like they wanted to make it so that you didn't have to. And this is what's interesting is they wanted to make it so you could have certain types of fantasy. So if you wanted to be more that protector, kind of like that crusader type cleric, you could you could choose that without being the paladin. But um, then you could also choose the healer type character you know and i think there was one more that they had oh, it's like a kind of a scholar like a spellcaster scholar type a healer type and a mortal martial type i think is the the way to break that down but i thought that was kind of a kind of a, a better way to think of the cleric and i think that that was probably the first time out of all these videos that i watched that they've been putting out that i actually said oh I feel like these are actually good calculated changes. And they also like changed when they got their subclass. So they put it up at third level so that now that there's more consistency across the board. So you don't get like, you don't get people that multi-class that dip into a class for one or two levels to steal like a subclass <laughs> right, right out of the gate. They have to kind of, they have to well, invest a little bit more time in that, that. What they're usually trying to steal, I think is, uh, um, is the like, uh, bonuses. abilities the bonuses yeah and abilities yeah so i think so like i said i think they made some decisions with the cleric that i i kind of agree with and i'm gonna i'll look through it a little bit more but you know that's the way it goes um they also got feedback on the um the dragonborn and the that's what they're called right dragonborn yes and the ardlings um i kind of i kind of thought that was weird because as soon as i looked at the dragonborn i was like why are all their breath weapons the same well, now they're changing it. Now all the Dragonborn get to use, they I guess they get to choose <laughs> if they what they want to do. You know, like they can either do a cone or a, or a line or whatever it is. And so I think that's going to be a positively received thing. And then the art lanes are going to be full on beast mode. They still didn't cool. release any. They didn't release any cover art with it though. So, but whatever. Yeah. That's because they're they're gonna see if people just like want to burn them off the planet. We'll we'll see. We'll see. I mean, well, but I mean, what's the benefit? Uh, do you think of them going into like full beast mode on it? Because they also they also kind of walked back a little bit on the um, how do I say it? They walked back a little bit on the uh, on you know like the the whole premise of them being like counter to tieflings, and now they're just kind of like from the beast lands or whatever it is. Did you well, see that, is, that? that yeah, you. I think we talked about it, but that is the. Um, I mean, I think that's the whole thing is. Uh, like, I I don't think people were happy with the. Uh, counter to. It seems to me like people weren't happy with the, their anti, tieflings, that didn't yeah. that doesn't seem to be the thing that people really wanted, uh, really wanted so. Um, that's probably what they're like. We have this now. Well, and the thing is that they like paid for the design of the character, like some writer, they paid some writer to do it. So mm -hmm. they're like, well, how can we make people want to you to play this class? Um, and yeah. it's like, Oh, we'll just, uh, we'll change it. So, so as much as I think that maybe there's a, a little bit 
of me that says, you know, they're probably doing the internal testing and they're just kind of, you know, checking social media and all that kind of stuff for possible, you know, possible pushback on how they're they're doing with that. You know, maybe there is probably some degree that they're going to be looking at these things because they made some significant changes to the Ardlings. And so who knows? Who knows? But I think more importantly now, um, I feel like I don't have the endurance to... <laughs> Oh, absolutely read, not. To keep up with all these changes, because because for anybody that has been following us and following the uh, and following the changes that they have, the the part that's the most difficult about this is that this is going to be, oh god, it's going to be years in the making. And so, like, could you imagine having to like, oh, every four weeks, just be like, okay, new changes, and you're just diving into that stuff and going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like god no i can't like uh like people are more power to people that want to like just do stuff about just this but like i'm i think the release schedule already has me just tired of it like i i was kind of excited at first and now i'm like uh, i think i'm okay <laughs> yeah Oh, and just to, um, I'm already, I'm already correcting myself, but they have um, the protector, the scholar, and thaumaturge for clerics. So those are the yeah. Three which one heals? Because that's, that's the uh, only one people are going to be told to play. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I'd do the thaumaturge, you know, because they're the delving deeper into your divine magical abilities. You prepare one extra zero level spell from the divine spell list, and scholars are like studying and teaching about lore of the gods in the multiverse, and protector is like beat shit up so yep that's my story stick to it sounds sounds delightful yeah so we'll see i mean i feel like i feel i feel like this is this, what probably is going to happen is that this is you know the end of the, the end of this is going to be like we predicted you know a lot more of a very similar fe feeling game to what we play today in fifth edition which is fine because you know they don't want to you know half of their player base but at the same time we're going a long way to just make enough changes to make the game better like it's it's like we're just going through a very high profile and very very you know visible errata of the game exactly and i really like, think and like yeah and i mean in part this is probably part of hasbro's things too is they're just trying to drum up like interest they want people to be interested so they're just trying to drum up that interest for yeah. for it you know like and i i guess i don't blame them but like at some point it's like man can you guys man just man just man um like it's just gonna be like just doing this for as long as they kind of plan on doing this just seems like a lot yeah um so well that's okay but you know i'm still you know I'm, I'm still a sucker and i did pick up shadows of the dragon queen and that alternate cover looks fucking amazing it like, does the ultimate cover does look uh much better than so good the regular cover so yeah. good and and of course so this is what happened to me is that basically they you know so they called me one night to go be like hey your pre-order shadows of the dragon queen is is available and i'm like oh, fuck yeah i'm gonna go get that and read it tonight and I drove down there, I, you know, and I went into the comic book store and I was like, I'm here to pick up my copy. And they're like, oh, we didn't mean for you to come down tonight. You had to come down tomorrow or later. Yeah, we like, can't we can't give it. We can't give it to you tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Because because obviously they called me on a Monday and I guess I for I, the I six I, is I, actually when it came out. Yeah. Yeah. So like they called me on a Monday and then they meant they meant to tell me that they could pick it up tomorrow or later. But just to let them know it was in. And uh, so as an impulse purchase, I picked up uh, Cyborg because I had a copy just in there. And I was like, ooh, it's a smaller book than I expected. I expected it to be full size, but um, God. I don't, think, I don't think Stockholm Cartel uh, puts out regular size books. They're all about that size. Uh, really? Yeah. Man, obviously. Yeah, you know, you know, size. Uh, yeah well, no, Mokborg had a bigger – well, I guess I saw something larger on the shelf that they had for Morkborg, so that's why – but I, uh, I do. It's not the more core core book then, because they're the same no. size. No, no, <laughs> it's something not. else. They're because because I have both of them, uh, and I have Death in Space coming, and I can I can I can confirm that oh. uh, uh, that Stockholm Cartel. I don't think, like I said, I don't think they put out like they have a formula, and they're pretty happy with their formula. 
we put out these uh, small OSR books. And people are happy, and we keep on putting them out. So exactly, I mean, why why change your formula, really? Exactly. So, so yeah, yeah. So I did I did pick that up. I'm excited. Um, it does take place during the War of the Lands. It looks like I have yet to really read much more than just the cover. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of interested to see what it is. I did check to see if they had you know minotaur specific to the setting, and the answer is no. So I figured. Uh, yeah. I I don't know. I man, I don't like that personally yeah. and we can talk about this later but i yeah, think we'll uh about. i think setting it in the war of the lance is a mistake oh really yeah um because it's like anything like like there's already heroes in the war of the lance yeah and and i and I, it's my understanding is that the uh that they're not going to like replace the heroes in that if that makes sense it's but, going to but what I'm what I'm saying is it steals it's in my opinion it steals the heroes thunder a little bit because like anybody who wants to play Dragon Plants Dragon Lance knows about the War of the Lance trilogy and has probably read it. And there's this mm-hmm. thing where it's like all this other heroic stuff is happening and your characters are just kinda I feel like your characters are dimmed by it a little bit. Mm, maybe all. I think yeah. Forgotten Realm Forgotten Realms runs into the same problem. There's so many heroes running around everywhere in Forgotten yeah. Realms that it just, I think, dims the light of your characters a little bit. But imagine oh. running into Kaz the Minotaur. I love, I love me which some Kaz. Should, yeah, which would be cool, but like I said. Yeah. Eh, but you could, and see, the thing is, you could run, as long as they're not dead, you could run into Kaz after the War of the Lands. Like, running into them when they're retired, which I don't remember if he dies or not, but running into them when they're retired, like, is one thing. Like, that's still cool. But um, haven't been changing the story because you, you know, kidnapped him because you were envious of his position in the storyline. Exactly. Or yeah. your players do that, you know, do that one, you know, do what players do and kill the blue dragon like 13 chapters before the end of the War of the Lance. And you're like, uh, eh, whatever. I mean, it's yep. my story, but weird. But anyway, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I'm sure we'll try to maybe pop into that at some point. We can give a, a more detailed, you know, <laughs> after play review and so on to cyberpunky things and so i thought it would be good to talk a little bit about the fact that there is some good news possibly and it's the fact that neuromancer is going to be on apple tv um right now they've they seem to have tapped um a guy named graham roland to be the showrunner uh he's done things like lost and jack ryan and the lead actor that they are thinking about getting for case is miles teller now what's and it's funny about Miles Teller is that I didn't realize Miles Teller and Ty Sheridan were two different people. Um, <laughs> Miles Teller is the guy from uh, Fantastic Four and a few of those other movies, um, and Ty Sheridan is a guy from Ready Player One. I thought they were the same person, and I apologize to both of them. <laughs> well, you learned something today. Yeah, I think Miles Teller. He was also in the new um, Top Gun movie, so. That's I think um, that's his biggest profile thing. Sure, I'm never gonna know for sure because I'm never gonna see Top Gun. So, and there we just alienated our entire audience. Hey, if you like Top Gun, more power to you. I did not like the first one, so yeah. So, so it's actually interesting because you know if it starts next year and Apple TV has kind of been building this reputation for quality shows. I mean, if you had one concern, like how Neuromancer could be perverted in a um, in a terrible way, like what would be the one thing you would want to be most pure to the story? I just want the characters to be like the characters, sim- more similar to the characters from the book. Yeah. Like Johnny and Johnny Mnemonic, like the movie was not the Johnny in the book Mm. Uh, and neither was the girl that was supposed to be molly but that was i think intentional because molly is a super cool badass character and chains or whatever her name was is not um (laughs) you know i i haven't i didn't actually remember what the uh, character they put in johnny mnemonic's name was the movie i I think i think her name was chains i think is what they called her and, and in, uh, the, in the book, she's Molly Millions, right? Yeah, it's Molly Millions. Yeah, the yeah. the the template street samurai, uh, solo sort of character that is in like that is 
a stereotype in the in in all of cyberpunk mm-hmm. um you know with the finger razors and the pumped up reflexes and stuff yeah and just overall badass like super badass yeah super badass and it's and it's always kind of funny to me because like um you know like you see these really awesome characters and stuff like that and then you they don't make it to screen at all and you're like what? why but but you're almost kind of happy they didn't because if they would have made it to the screen then they were just done poorly it's almost better that they just kind of left them out oh yeah i'm i'm super glad they just left them out like yeah. i'm super glad that they didn't call her molly at all because that gives you hope that someday um someday there will be a molly in one of the book and one of the movies that's good yeah um, it's, it's sort of like uh john constantine would like constantine would have been an okay movie if it hadn't been called john constantine if it hadn't been called constantine um, you're talking about the keanu reeves movie yeah like it probably would have oh. been like at least okay if it hadn't been called Constantine, um, but because it was like there is this anticipation of what the character was going to be like, mm-hmm. British, um, and because he wasn't, uh, it was just a failure <laughs> on a bunch of levels. Yeah, well, I mean, but they didn't. Did they do that in the TV show? I didn't actually watch the TV show. I did not watch the TV show either. I'm talking yeah. about the movie. Yeah, the. Because they're doing a second one now. Yeah, but I think that's most mostly based on the star power that Keanu Reeves has. Just be, you know, I mean, he's seemed I, to be I, kind I, of a like, everywhere. <laughs> I get that, but uh, Keanu Reeves isn't Johnny Constantine. I'm sorry. Anyways, moving on from my personal gripes against uh, the Constantine movie. Yeah, and so well, I mean, but the good news is is that at least if Edge Runners gives you a preview of how you can do successful um cyberpunk stuff i feel like that gives me a lot of hope for how they could do neuromancer and i and i don't know if it was mentioned if it was going to be live action or not but i i kind of thought it would be live action i didn't i think i i think if i remember right the little that i read read back in the day it is going to be live action which is fine because um you know gibson's cyberpunk is Mm -hmm. the more reserved type of cyberpunk it's not anime quite as much as edge runners is yeah it's more befitting a live action interpretation that's good but but i think my i think the point just is is that edge runners kind of came out of came out of the the you know came out of the corner swing and and it was fucking fantastic in my opinion it was and it it was and it kind of came out of nowhere and i think it really revitalized the the game uh Mm -hmm the cyberpunk 2020 game. And I know it kind of revitalized the role-playing game a little bit. I know it got a shot in the arm. Oh yeah. So. I mean, you know, looking at like drive through RPG, you always see cyberpunk red as kind of like one of the top selling, um, top selling books. And then, you know, cause they have that like top 20 yep. or whatever it is. Cyberpunk red has been sitting in the top five for the last few weeks that I've been looking at it. So yeah. it's been, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of sad cause I, I hate to say this, but I've never really played cyberpunk red cyberpunk 2020 or anything like that. Mostly because all of my cyberpunk, you know, all of my cyberpunk exposure came through the cyberpunk adjacent <laughs> shadow right. run game, you know, yeah, shadow run. so it's, it was definitely cyberpunk, but it was also cyberpunk magic, like dark urban fantasy kind of stuff. Right. So, um, but I, yeah, I, I think you could make like, it, Cyberpunk 2020 and the Cyberpunk games are very much very stripped, more stripped down. Yeah, but yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I think that'll be a, a good thing for an answer. Yeah, I'm excited because honestly, like, I, I just I, there was there was very few faults that I had with with Edge Runners, and I think if that if the same kind of care and love and and creativity is put into Neuromancer, I, I mean, I probably... I agree. I really loved uh, I really loved the Edge Runner show. I think it was really yeah. good. And I loved all the Easter eggs that they wound up adding to the um, the game mm-hmm. uh, after the show. Like you can get oh really like, yeah you can get David's jacket. Like you can oh, go nice. and get the Edge Runner jacket. Uh, you can get Rebecca's shotgun. <laughs> guts, Sweet. cult guts. Um, and I went and got it in the game because I was like, oh, you can. Uh, nice. And so yeah, so like that stuff is really cool. Like the tie-ins are really cool. Again, you get that you get that kind of, and they're all dead. And there are spoilers. Most of them are dead. Um, so, uh, like, you don't get that overshadowed feeling when you're playing it in the game because, like, you learn past. about you learn about them, but they're in the past, yeah. Yeah. And so I think it was done really, really well. 
Well, and I think and and I think Edge Runners. A spoiler alert for anybody that's listening is that you know I think that the fact that David really he was that kind of self-sacrificing, self-destructive character in the end was I th- I thought really represented it well. You know, <laughs> like he it it was good to see a, a main character that didn't just like oh he who knows what happened you knew exactly what happened to david he made some very very personal choices and what he was going to do with the next whatever six hours of his life or however long that was and, right. and that had the logical conclusion that it came to um but you know there was a point in there where you're like oh he could fight toe-to-toe against adam smasher and then you're like oh wow well, toe-to-toe mm-hmm. might have been exaggerating a little bit <laughs> Um, well, uh, yeah, and and that's the thing is like they may da- David is a good heroic character. Um, at the end of the end of the end of the show, he's heroic mm-hmm. with he's he's heroic, but in a more realistic way, which is very much a a cyberpunk thing. Like, yeah, cyberpunk is very 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 much about like sure, there's heroes in this place, but they're not always gonna make it. Well, yeah, and, and like he he doesn't save. I mean, he sort of saves the day in a, in a well. Like, Lucy Lucy gets Lucy out. gets away. Yeah, like I mean, that's as that's as far as like I mean, it wasn't it was a and that was his, right. That was his goal was to get Lucy out. Like that was what he really wanted. Exactly, and so I mean, it, but it was a trade off, and it but it was a sensible trade off. It wasn't like it wasn't ill conceived. It wasn't like you know it wasn't contrived. It was. It was good. I mean, it was satisfying to watch the end of that and going, oh, yep, I just watched that show. I don't, th- there's never going to be another season of Edge Runners, and I'm okay with that, you know? Oh, you don't, think most... that you, you don't think there's going to be another season? I don't think David's going to make it to season two. No, no, no. I think there'll be another season, but I think it's going to be different, different right. Edge Runners. It would be like an anthology story, right? Kind of like they do with that True Detective thing. I mean, they could yeah, do it it'll that be, way. Yeah, it'll be kind of like that. That's what I think is it's going to be. If, yeah, and and I guess if they wanted to do that, I would probably I'd probably sign up for a second season. But I mean, but I just like that there was a there was a story told here, and there wasn't that like, oh, there could be a sequel because of you know we kind of left it ambiguous as to the fate of the characters, right? You know, they they pretty much you know <laughs> signed here on the dotted line. This is what happened. Oh yeah, this is this is this is done. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're correct. Yeah, so that was that, was, and that's all I was saying is that I really like that component of it because most of the time when and th- this is this happens in anime a lot where they like kind of leave you know season endings kind of ambiguous as to what's happening because they like try to tease having that next season and then if that next season never comes you're like fuck me, right? <laughs> the like, story oh, is. I was really hoping that that was you know more was going to happen with that. Yeah, but instead they just they just gave you blue balls and moved on with life because apparently the executives did not get the same level of blue balls to make, right. make that second. The executives season. didn't. Uh, the executives didn't get the same memo as everybody else. Yeah. So. So yeah. So I mean that's good. So I think that you know with with cyberpunk having a I, I'm not going to say renaissance, but having a little bit of uh, bubbling up in the pop culture scene and having its its you know day in the sun again, which is really cool. I mean cyberpunk, it's it's a really fun genre, and I think it's nice to see it. And people challenge themselves to not treat it as though it's retro futurism, which is always a fun argument to have about cyberpunk. But um, but yeah. So what about the games? We have games. There are um, games. There are cyberpunk games to talk about. There are cyberpunk games to talk about. So what's funny is that we're going to talk about cyberpunk, and we're not going to talk about Shadowrun, which, I mean, that's where I cut my teeth on cyberpunk, and really my only exposure from an RPG standpoint. And I do have to say that cyberpunk, or the sorry, Shadowrun Sixth Edition is my least favorite edition that I played. Oh man, that was we tried that playing was, that, and it was painful. It was it was a little tough. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that they haven't had some good additions. And so I think Shadowrun has always had. Uh, it's always, it has rules problems. Uh, Shadowrun is, um, there's an argument that Shadowrun is not really a cyberpunk game. There is. Um, which I sort of agree with, um, Mm -hmm. after delving more into, um, kind of what real cyberpunk quote unquote looks like. Um, it's a fun game though, and it is a world that I suggest people play in, and definitely has some cyberpunk tropes. But I don't know if I would completely call it a cyberpunk. 
Yeah, uh, but it's fun. I mean, it, I mean, it hits it hits a lot of different notes because you could obviously make it less magic and more tech and all that stuff. But it, but I think the setting loses a lot of its charm. If you well, if you're gonna make it less magic, you might as well just play Cyberpunk game. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I will for I will forever argue, uh, as I always do, that uh, you know, yeah, if you're gonna I mean, if you're gonna gonna change things, you might as well play a different game um sometimes so but yeah cyberpunk is good we're not going to talk about that uh what was the game that you wanted to talk about uh so i'm going to talk about shadow of the beanstalk um from fantasy flight games and it's and i mean it's it's pretty much like cyberpunk as best as you can get as far as i can tell um i'm not as best as you can get but i think that the setting is really solid cyberpunk but i can't necessarily say based on what i've read so far that it's it's super imaginative it's, it's weird i'll talk i'll tell you about it so i'm gonna do a little bit of sh- shadow of the beanstalk and uh and you were gonna do a little bit of cyborg cyborg so the, the morkborg spinoff do you want to rochambeau for uh who goes first uh why don't you go first because it'll probably be a little long well yeah it'll probably be a little longer than uh cyborg cyborg's pretty pretty cut and dry really so go for it all right so, okay, well, I'll jump in. Um, so the preface here is I'm actually going to only do um, a little bit of, you know, impressions on the system setting itself, not the rule set. Because the the first thing is, is that, so Shadow of the Beanstalk was published by Fantasy Flight Games um, slash Edge Studios in 2019. Now, Edge Studios is kind of like the, like, there were some changes. So you might hear Edge Studios when you go to buy it. Um, you know, on drive through RPGs and stuff like that. It's it's all the same company. They just made some different changes as to how things are branded and how they're released and all that stuff. <laughs> but the but Shadows of the Beanstalk is actually part of what's called the Android setting. Um, and the Android setting is is a, is actually it was originally a board game uh, back in 2008. So apparently, you know, and I I had obviously never heard of the board game, um, and I never played it, but it seemed like it won some tabletop awards, and it won enough of a following that it, um, you know, kind of started to build up a little momentum. And what they did is they actually remade a popular uh, collectible card game from the '90s called Netrunner. Another mm-hmm. thing I'd never heard of. <laughs> I, I I've known about Netrunner. I've... Like I've I've heard that before, but I didn't realize I... that was like a a thing. Yeah, no, I've had experience with uh, Netrunner, the card game. Yeah, and so they actually created this a new collectible card game called Android Netrunner. Um, and, you know, people liked it well enough, and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of circa 2012 and everything like that. So what ends up happening is is that, you know, as as this kind of, as as a intellectual property, I guess, it was not necessarily shelved, um, but Fantasy Flight um, released the Genesis system. And this is why I'm not doing like a rules breakdown, because I do think that Genesis probably deserves its own, um, it deserves kind of its own discussion, like in depth and everything like that, because it uses a, a it, it, it's kind of like a, how do we, what are those systems called where they're like, it's, it's kind of setting agnostic. It kind of gives you the backbone to create whatever system you want, yeah. because these rules are flexible enough to play you know, you could play modern, you could play superhero, you could play, <laughs> you know, you could play. Yeah, it's uh, a, yeah, it's a I general fly. rule set, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and so this narrative dice system replaces your standard dice and you have kind of these symbols that are on either D12s, D10s, or D6s. And you have these different, you know, these things that basically cancel things out or, and, you know, you kind of determine advantages, success, threats, failures, and a complicated bunch of other things that, you know, force you to tell the story through this fantasy flight proprietary die set you could i guess you could use d6s d12s and d10s with that don't have the symbols you just have to do some you know rough translation and stuff like yep. that fantasy flight is good for that they uh yeah. they like they like their bits and bobs yeah so i mean i mean worst case scenario is if you really wanted to play it you could just get the dice roller um you could just get the dice roller app that they have on ios or android and then done <laughs> and you just roll dice that way you don't have to buy any dice or anything to play it but yeah. uh, i think that's why i just really wanted to kind of talk about this setting um and so the so this the if you were to get shadow of the beanstalk you have to have the genesis core book so they're not giving you they're not you know giving away the milk with the cow they're basically like <laughs> or giving away the cow with the milk that's it 
There we go. I don't know my analogies. You have to buy and the I, Genesis. You have to buy the cow. You don't get the milk for free, I believe is uh, what you're looking something, for. Something like that. Whatever the analogy is about milk and cows, that's just imagine I said it correctly the first time. Gotcha. Um, that, so you have to buy the Genesis core book so you can actually have the baseline how to play the game um, so that when you, you know, fix this, uh, you know, Shadow of the Beanstalk on it, you can have kind of a, you know, a full realized setting and everything like that. And I, and it's my understanding that Shadow of the Beanstalk was kind of one of the two settings that they did. They did a fantasy setting and then they did a sci-fi setting and this Android Shadow of the Beanstalk was what they did with the, uh, with the, the sci-fi part of the setting. So in essence, I mean, the, the cool thing about the setting is, is that like the, the, the thing that struck me a little bit is that it, it very much focused on, you know, like how technology advances, how technology changes us, you know, like, um, it's one of those things where, you know, like people are as crowded as ever in these giant mega cities. And the reason why it's called shadows of a beanstalk is that they're, you know, Wayland industries. I don't know why always the famous like mega bad guys but wayland uh, like a wayland industries um can make a conglomerate basically makes a space elevator and this is space elevator is called the beanstalk oh, and okay. that makes sense. and so the and this allows for people to start you know have a low cost method to reach the stars and this allows them to get to the moon and beyond. And they discover on the moon helium three. Helium three is a is an isotope that allows you to have really cheap energy. So it kind of solves the energy problem back on Earth. Well, the economic benefits that having the ability to kind of go into space and grabbing these resources and having trade, you know, on a planet wide scale, um, creates a kind of a mega city that's around this beanstalk. And I think it's, I uh, don't actually remember where it was located, but it was like located in Central America. So you have to imagine that like 500 million people live in proximity to this beanstalk just because of the economic wealth that is generated through this corridor kind of thing. And so that's, it's the shadow of the beanstalk. So it's, it's appropriately named. And what I thought was interesting is that if you read the news, helium three is like a real space race happening right now. <laughs> Like, yeah. I don't, have you heard about that? How China is trying to build stuff to go up to space to get helium three, and America is trying to join them and all that stuff. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. So I don't know if it was precognitive. I mean, it just I think it was just you know intuitive application of like events and kind of realizing how this stuff could go. So right. So from a sci-fi setting, I thought that they had some really good things like that. They added like things like Bucky Weave, you know, like so Bucky Weave is like an uh, whatever it's a it's it's a carbon type deal that has you know like super you know super strong properties and all that kind of stuff you know so they they kind of hit science and all this and all these right. different they, areas they, they managed to put some real science in there exactly they managed to put real science in there to give you this setting and then they kind of make it so that it's kind of dystopic because you know as as bright as the future is you know there's always those cracks in the foundation right you know, people, it, you know, kind of reminds me that, you know, like people are socially isolated. You know, everything that you do is always monitored. <laughs> you know, you've got like as you walk by, you know, you're you're being tracked by ad sensors. You know, you're you're you have zero privacy because, you know, you're you're always known as to where you are and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of it's it hits cyberpunk from those um, from those, I think, notes. It also has a really big component on hacking which I think is a really important thing. And I, and from, and without having played it, it has a really dedicated chapter to hacking. And so like, you know, if you really wanted to see a game that may have gotten it right, I would be excited to see how their, their system plays out to see if they, they give you a good feel for how it would be to hack through a system and kind of, kind of get into that almost, um, you know, like, in, like how, how do you do your, you know your intrusions through the net and how do you control things and you know extract information etc 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 so so yeah so in in general though i mean yeah, you know in, in terms of like gameplay wise i don't know i i think that there's a lot like without knowing more about genesis i don't know if it would be a good game to play but setting wise i think it's interesting enough but there's not really anything that like the weird part about it is, is as closely as they align with you know available technologies to kind of give you that 20 minutes in the future look I, there's nothing that really was like exciting about it, you know, like, 
like, ooh, this is a super cool cyberpunk setting because of eh. Right? There was nothing really that I could point my finger to. It was just it just seemed like a really solid setting that seemed well enough put together to be fun. Yeah. It sounds interesting. It does sound like a really interesting game. Um and if they can do hacking, um, any sort of decking, hacking, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um like that's something a lot of games struggle with um it becomes a separate system within the system that causes all sorts of problems shadowrun really suffered from a lot of that problem uh Mm -hmm. where decking became like oh it's totally different game than the one that we're playing well and Uh, i think i think you might always suffer from that a little bit but i think that I, I, what i'm interested to see is just how it plays out because it is it is like a subsystem right it is a you know, like, how do you go into the metaverse and, you know, and how do you play through that? Because it is a slightly different thing. But I guess my question is, is do they make it so that it's not cumbersome? <laughs> That's kind of what I meant, too, is, is yeah, do they make it so it's not so much your character is isolated or cumbersome with the other with the other characters? Um, mm-hmm. Like, cause there's just a lot of there's usually a lot of juggling that goes on with um, others that's gone on with, with other systems in there. Shadowrun really runs on the problem of no precognition like um like for a long time nothing was wireless at all in Mm -hmm. shadowrun like that became a thing um you know so so yeah yeah that was because they were they were so far ahead of their time before wireless phones were invented Uh, before wireless anything like yeah how connected people are was like a total surprise shadow apparently Exactly, and that's what, and that's something that is interesting as well about Shadows of the Beanstalk because they really kind of call that out as that you know you've got you've got the whole world in your at, at your fingertips, but you know you don't have any friends, you don't have any any right. nearby, you know, like you don't have community. You're just you're just in you're just inserted into the machine and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of lose your identity because you know you. I mean, I I, I always find that you know like and I'm not advocating for China by any means, like that's not what it is, but that social credit system is kind of like how I feel that cyberpunk could be run. That could be a cyberpunk trope or component. Mm -hmm. So. It sounds interesting. It definitely sounds like an interesting setting. Yeah. I think it's got some good enough stuff um, in it to like really entice me to look at Genesis as a system and like learn how to play it. I don't know when we would play it based on our current slate of stuff that we. That we um, it would be interesting just to see, like, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll look into the book and just see what the rule set is like, because, like, the fact is, if it, uh, I mean, if it's too complicated, like, which sometimes they are, it'd be interesting to see. Well, I mean, the narrative die system, I think, is what intrigues me the most about how that resolves. You know, and like how you start telling your story through those types of resolution dice. But I mean, I, I'm going to say that, you know, in terms of like cyberpunk type systems, I would be interested enough in this to to run an adventure or two or or whatever. And you know what? You never know. Maybe when we're done with Basin, I, I mean, obviously, I just have to run uh, Shadows of the Dragon Queen for all you guys. And then I need to run a cyberpunk game and then I need to run. There's, there's always there's always the list. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> just put it on the list. And I think I think if if anything, people will tell me you know what games they want to play and all that stuff. And I I don't mind settling into a game for a little bit. So this may be a so listeners, I just say that it may be a little while before we actually you know act, we actually play the game. Indeed. Yeah. So that's my story. Sticking to it. So I was going to talk a little bit about cyb- uh, cyborg, uh, the more pork kind of. Mm-hmm. I guess hack i think is the popular term um okay. for it um more board rules are, are are easy um they're osr rules everything's a d20 roll you roll a d20 you add your skill everything if you succeed if you get over a 12 okay um that, so the rules are easy um all the characters you have a bunch of different characters and they and they handle every you know it's just abilities though um like it's not really a campaign game. It's it's like a series of like episodes or one shots kind of strung together. So okay. like hacking in Morkborg is like just a, a, a character ability. Same sort of thing. Like roll a d20 and see what you get out of it. Um, I can't mm. remember specifically what some of the abilities are, but it's just like, you know, if they're game, know about this thing because you hacked, you know. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty simple game. The setting is really kind of cool. Um, there's, I think, a meteorite with nanites that hits the planet. And so you have, like, people that are infested with nanites that can, can kind of have pseudo-mystical powers. Um, and you have some cults um, around these mystical powers. It's very Morkborg in a cyberpunk setting. Um, you have the same sort of doom counter where, you know, every session you roll a dice. Uh, and then if you know you get to seven of the specific dice roll um the game's over like the the result for it is is like uh so and so has found out that the world is a simulation and unplugged the computer um you know that sort of thing um okay. it's it's it, it would be really it's 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 like more boring it would be really fun like one shot cyberpunk game the first, the game that you got i got with the the pre-order um, is your characters are going on a job, you know, because that's a cyberpunk trope where your punks are, you know, getting missions from people to go on. Um, and the job is to reacquire this guy. So the scientist made a new uh, hyper edge tech cyber legs. Um, okay. and someone stole them from him. And so <laughs> he hired the, he he's hired the team to go get them back. And so, they the, they find out that the guy that had stole them is a kill ball player. That's a sport in the Cy in Morkborg universe. Okay. But the Psy is what they call the city, the Psy. Um, and like your job is to just go and get them back however mm -hmm. you can. And it's an OSR game. So like what's kind of neat about the OSR games is is like it doesn't tell you anything about like how like if this happens you if this happens give the characters this information or whatever it just basically says <laughs> he's having a like he's the best time to do it is he's having this party you got to go infiltrate the party and get it cut his legs off somehow um it doesn't say you know this will happen if he dies this will happen if he doesn't it yeah. just tells you who's going to be there it gives you a chart of like things that'll happen like you roll randomly like every so often and like where he moves through the party and stuff like that. So it's kind of a, for me, I haven't done too many OSR games. So like for a simple, like game of just like one shot stuff, it's yeah. really kind of interesting to me to run a kind of cyberpunk game like that, because there's usually more like, it's a game that's kind of detached from narrative, which I think is kind of interesting. Okay. Um, a friend of mine once uh, said what, how you should run shadow run is you should just have a table um, and you should just like roll a dice as to, like, successful or or like <laughs> did you have a successful shadow run or did something go wrong because all of the all, like all of the story ones there is like oh something went wrong well then i guess we're actually doing this job then um like we're role playing <laughs> it out because because those are the those are the ones that are interesting right they're the ones that go wrong and your characters yeah. never should have every single shadow run they do go wrong which they're players so that means they do um so yeah so that's kind of cyborg it's um the little snippets about the city are kind of cool um they give you some descriptions on different areas like mm -hmm. there's the rich part of town that they describe it's behind the wall um and then just you know the slums and how sleep you know graffitied up and horrible they are and how uh you know the nanites of what is the nano caster i think is what the nano guy is called and he has a bunch of like weird abilities that are kind of like magic um mm -hmm. So it's very cyberpunk with an uh kind of a different edge, a more board edge. Um Okay. It's really cool. It's really a pretty cool game. I was the the setting surprised me with how much I enjoyed it. Okay. And you feel like um and so I guess some of the questions I always have, you know, with this kind of stuff is that, you know, with the this the book, because I picked up a copy of, like I said, as an impulse buy. Um it you know it seems like a very light book like i don't feel like there's a rules heaviness at all to it and it seems like you could you know first of all it seems like you you know it's not intimidating other than the one thing that's interesting is that if you like a logically laid out book um cyborg and probably morkborg are going to be hard to follow in spots but that, i mean that's kind of i mean that's cyborg is put together a little bit more logically than morkborg is it is. Yeah, it is. I, I, I don't have the, the two to compare, but I just I just like how, you know, like it's, you know, all of a sudden you're looking at tables and you're like, ooh, let's add some flair to your. your yeah, Morkborg, Morkborg is very much style. In lieu, not in lieu, but style presentation mm -hmm. 
in lieu of ease of of absorption um yeah. because i think i think this benefits just from the setting because there's a lot of computers and logic mm-hmm. in cyberpunk i think that helped them lay this out a little bit better like you don't get weird like bright pink text on yellow backgrounds or anything in in workboard really or in no. cyborg really um which is a, which in workboard you do sometimes it's like ah oh, i can't read that um uh so it's a little bit better to better put together there is one thing that i think is strange um there's a rule all of the characters have this rule that's like replace any other random cyberware with like one of your character's special abilities like the nano sorcerer guy like Uh if he has cyberware replace any of his cyberwares with his ability his abilities right and it's like where would they get extra like where do they get the extra cyberware like and i don't i don't know i don't know where so like i was like i don't understand why that's there um and i still haven't found i still haven't figured that out and i've read it a couple times so i'm still kind of looking for that but that was the only rule that i was really confused on um was like where are these characters getting this stuff at starting um and it is like it is like work borg and it's, it's hyper lethal like you only you're only ever going to have like four hit points to start if you're lucky yeah um so um but yeah it is put together better than work borg i will say that um it is oh. hyper it is hyper rules light as the osr systems are um like it's it's not like your rolling is mostly going to be for abilities in combat. It's not going to be, I want to find this out and roll this dice. It's more going to be like, do this. I want to do this thing. Okay, roll your dice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, I'm realiz- it- what, I, what I'm realizing about a lot of the OSR systems is there are challenges that are going to be president- presented that aren't just for the player character. They are going to be challenges to the challenge the player themselves. So there are some meta stuff that happen oh, in a yeah. lot of OSR games, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and I think that it, you know it's one of those things where you know I think we discussed before where sometimes the the role playing air quotes. It, obviously, I'm air quoting around role playing is that you know some people find that to be the 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 part of the game they really get invested in. Other people really find just the the game itself like, oh, this is your mission. How do you do it? I don't need to get, you know, into fancy voices and, you know, make it theatrical and all that stuff. They just, you know, right. They, they, they just play from a 10,000 foot view and enjoy the shit out of it. And that's all that they need. And sometimes OSR makes that really easy. (laughs) Right. It is. It's, it's a very, um, it's like I said, it's a, it's different for me because like, I've always played games that is like, I expect your character, you know, I expect the characters to go on. Like to be not, I mean, perpetual to a degree, because that's like one of the things like we consider, like, look at like D&D, like ongoing D&D stories, ongoing Shadowrun stories with the same characters. Like, that's what we look at. And like Morkborg, Cyborg and a lot of those, like, and I think Death in Space is a little bit different, but like Morkborg and Cyborg, like, they're not written that way at all. They're written more like what I would couldn't call con games, where Mm -hmm. it's like you are you're gonna die like you're 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 not your character's probably gonna die and even if your character does survive for a long a long time like the game is gonna end and it could end randomly like it could end yeah like at any time so um you know so that's kind of interesting for me from that standpoint um i think the psi the the like setting of cyborg um i think Mm -hmm. it could use a more expansive game because i think the setting's kind of cool for a cyberpunk game mixing the like biological pseudo magic of the the nanites and stuff like that um mm. it's kind of neat like the the setting that they wrote is, is is pretty engaging more engaging than um more engaging than i think the game actually needs probably um which is kind of you know it's like you know there's a there's a wealth within the book i think so well and you know it it kind of reminds me a little bit of this Reddit post I saw, you know, that was, uh, that was like, there was somebody was, uh, draw, like drawing out a dungeon, you know, the, like for the, for their group and all that kind of stuff. And the, the caption was something like, it was definitely like, Oh, Oh, back in my day it was like, back in my day, we didn't have all these published adventures. So we had to make our own damn dungeons tick marks right. on the sides. <laughs> And so, yeah. and that's kind of what I feel like, which that's the impression I got with this is that, you know, they give you enough to like, 
you know, give you a flavor of it and say, okay, well now you go and just create and do your thing. Now, did they have like tables to kind of like help the, help the GM DM? They do. Yeah, they do. Kind of like say like, okay, yeah. well here's your plot. Here's your hook. And then now just go. Yeah. Like, if you're, if you're, ge- yeah. If you want to generate one, they do have those resources. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, and then, and, and then any of the pre-published stuff is just like, oh yeah, this is, this is kind of it. This is kind of what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, which is, which is, like I said, it's kind of cool. They also give one of the things that came in the Mork Bork pack or Cyborg pack that I got was, um, there's like a, 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 a ream or a pamphlet of like, um, buildings and like just different, <laughs> different maps that you can use, which was kind of okay. cool too. Um, cause it's a resource that you could use, not just for this, but for like any game. So that was kind of cool too, that there's just this collection that you can use so now you said that they have adventures and stuff like that they have i don't know how many published ones there are they have one that came with the game which one um, came with the game which one is it called Let's was it see. something about lambs uh no i think that's let's see if i can remember what it is I do not remember what the name of the adventure is. Um, Reaper Repo. That's the name of the one that uh, I believe comes comes in the pack that I got. And it's like one sheet. Like it's like uh, it's almost like it's folded up. It's just like a poster. And like you mm-hmm. unfold it and it's just like 11 it's bigger than 11 by 12 but it's like this little poster sheet that you fold out and it's like oh yep this is the whole adventure um you know and it was really like i said it was kind of it was actually kind of neat um mm-hmm. uh the simplicity of the game like i said usually usually i use more complicated systems um uh you know like for example another recent buy to genesis like it's a much more complicated much more um dice driven you know na- not narrative like i i think i think i i think i probably use the word narrative wrong sometimes when i talk about some of these games um i've kind of decided in looking at mork borg and those like that like it's uh, no no it's more of a narrative game like an ongoing narrative game whereas the short narrative is important for cyborg um so that's that's yeah but it's 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 rules light, which is something that I'm not like rules light in to to me usually means brain heavy. Um, like if it's a rules light game, there's just like, well, what do you do if this happens? Um, mm-hmm. And Morkborg has everything kind of like like Morkborg and Cyborg. And I'm going to use a Morkborg example. But like if you come like if you decide your players are. You know, they come to a chasm, it's 25 feet across, what do you do? Like, there's no mm-hmm. dice rolls to figure that out. It's like the players are going to just have to figure it out. They're like, oh, well, I used our three 10-foot pieces of rope, and I make a, you know, we span, we bridge the gap that way, or we climb down, or whatever. You know, and then mm-hmm. those are things that are just kind of, there's not really rules for those, they just kind of happen. Um, you know? Um, yeah. And the more it's kind of like Morkborg. There's a Morkborg, the first Morkborg adventure that is in the book, um, has a part in it where it's like, okay, your adventurers look in this library. Okay, you find this book, roll a dice. Uh, it's like one, two is like, you're fine, you get a power. Three, four is like, you take two hit points of damage. Five, six is like, you can't use any of your abilities for the rest of the game and you lose two hit points. It's like, oh, oh, my character's just basically dead. Yeah, kind of. No, nah, um, not dead. Just just a passive observer. Yeah, the and it's glory like of others. And so it's like, yep. If you go down the cliff, you fall. Like, there's no way to climb down the cliff. Good job, bad choice. Like, that's kind of how those games are written. Like, and that's what I mean by it's kind of like a test for the character, and not just like the player, not just the character. That's that's funny because it it kind of reminded me. Uh, like we, I got this. Um, you know, somebody had kind of been converting some of those choose your old adventures mm-hmm. into like board games. You know, they could mm-hmm. be played by a few people that are all kind of playing the same character and all that stuff. And and 
uh, the wife and I were were playing that, and it was one of those, and it was it was as brutal because you basically like you have binary choices, you know, A or B, A or B, A, B or C, you know, like right. uh, not binary in every case, but you know, most of the time it's just one of one of a couple choices, and um, and I swear to like God, the first chapter because they're broken up into chapters, we did like six times. You know what you do if you die is you go back to your previous alive and you choose the other one. <laughs> Right. But it's like, I was kind of giving her lead, and she was, and it was funny because every time she was like, uh, "This one," I was like, it, "I mean, they don't obviously seem wrong, but it's just like, and you're ripped apart by dogs. What? Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, most OSR games don't care about the what I call the feels bad. Like mm-hmm. they don't really care if the character dies. Like like those bad interactions are. It's like, oh, I'm sad now. Like they don't care about that. Like D and D and like other games are like we want your character to last. We don't want the player to feel bad about something that's happening. Mm -hmm. Like Mo, like Morpork does not care. Um, it's like, uh, well, like some of your abilities, um, like Morpork, for example, like some of your abilities are like the, there's a character that's fantastically wealthy. And like one of their abilities is this, this, uh, they get this magic sword. Um, that does a, a, like an insane amount of damage. But like, if you roll a one, it like does it to you, because it hates you. Well, of course. <laughs> so, so like, work work does not care about that stuff. Like, like the OSR games and Cyborg is the same way. Like, it does not care about the players <laughs> feeling good. I mean, you will feel good when you get to the end of the adventure, and like, the adventure will probably feel good and everything. But like, if something bad happens, that something bad happens. Like, they don't care about the feels bad, which is something that is new to me because I've always, I've always wanted the characters to not get those feels bad moments, mm-hmm. um, so much, um, which, which we kind of talk about, like, like crit fails in D and D. Like, I consider those the height of feels bad, like because there's nothing you could really do about it. It's just dumb luck that you happen to fail. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's just, and it can be at a time where, and it, and it also depends on how, you know, the DM plays it out, but you obviously love it when I put a banana peel down and you slip on that and, <laughs> and then you have right. kind of like almost a, you know, a three stooges kind of. Yeah. The yakety <laughs> sax music playing and playing in the background as you're sliding around because you rolled a one four times in a row. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, that's what yeah. I'm, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So, um, so yeah, so I think that, uh, in terms of. So that's our take like, on, uh, Cyborg and the Shadow of the Beanstalk. Is that what it is? Shadow of the Beanstalk. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Skyhook is, uh, one of the things I wanted to say about Shadow of the Beanstalk that I just remembered is, uh, the Skyhook, um, I believe it's usually called the Skyhook, the elevator to space. Mm-hmm. um it's called a skyhook and most um stuff like that and that's interesting that they use that science yeah no it, it, like i said what was what was really struck me and it, and i mean it's and obviously they don't spend a lot of time on all the little bits um kind of explaining it but they they have enough science that's like it's like cutting edge for us today obviously yeah. um, and nobody has really built a space elevator uh, but you know, people have theorized how to do it. You know, so they, they they have enough of this stuff that it's like, like I said, twenty minutes into the future, we could have the types of things that this that that this sci-fi setting has kind of imagined and all that kind of stuff. And I always I always find that is very a very cool component when you have that level of like, I guess the level of like. Um, research into what it is i've always liked books that tend to like uh you know tend to for especially sci-fi books i always like books that tend to you know actually have a, at least a yeah. grain of of you prefer reality. more hard, hard sci-fi than uh, soft sci-fi yeah i mean what, one of my favorite books that it was a it was a slog to get through was basically about how this uh you know they were training these octopuses for octopus octopuses i think it's octopus. octopodes Octopodes. They they were training these octopuses uh, to send them into space, and um and like what it and what it, if I remember correctly like basically this this book you know you're you're kind of feeling really you know kind of like because apparently oct- an octopus is a very intelligent creature so they were training mm-hmm. it to like basically be this miner on this rock 
<laughs> you're just like, that's a real thing. And then you look and at the back and they're like, oh yeah. So all of this story is from these research papers and these yeah. things. That, you know, I was like, um, oh, shit. Like, that's one reason why I like Blue Planet as a space mm-hmm. setting is because the guy that writes it actually has a lot to do with like oceanography. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of the ocean stuff in it is like pseudo factual. Um, there's quite a bit of hard science in it, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's one of the things that makes the setting. If I never play a blue planet game, game, that's fine. But, um, it just makes it kind of interesting because it is a very more high hard hard sci-fi than, than a lot of the games that you see, like fading suns is not hard sci-fi at all. Mm -hmm. Um, De- death in space is more high hard, hard sci-fi that'll be pretty interesting to read so well it's always it's always tricky because like i always feel like if it's if it's not close enough like i mean you know you don't want to say it's like space magic but if there's no like fa- if there's no basis in reality then it's just sci fantasy right like as much as i love giant robots going around in space you know if you start making like they're like oh well we could have this metal unobtainium okay you know like i think that's what they called it in avatar isn't it they didn't they it call is what they call it. i believe that Unob- is what unobtainium they like i mean yeah. that's just a this is a placeholder for something that is like a mythical metal right you know like i i totally i totally couldn't remember that the other day when i was talking about that with somebody but that that is a hundred percent correct unobtainium is what they called it yeah so it's like you know you're like oh well you, you just didn't want to make up it was like a real mineral so you create unobtainium because you didn't want to be fact checked right and unobtainium well, no. I... well the funny part is i believe unobtainium is a thing um, it is and the reason that they call it that is because it's uh theorized it get you know it's 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 a material for a particular application but impractically hard to get and you know and so it's like it's just funny it's like it's a perfect material for what we're looking for but we if we could get it but we can't so so what what does that mean though like so yeah. the, the the plot hook in avatar uh, in avatar is about you know a mineral that they can't get to because it's not it's you just have to commit some sort of genocide and relocation of some indigenous people i mean that's that's you know what i'm saying like i, I don't know i feel like i feel like it it just is a little less you feel like they should do better i Fiction i should writers I, do better I do, and obviously, you know, because I'm going to be the guy that uh, that criticizes James Cameron and and wags my finger at him, saying, "You obviously don't know how to make billion dollar movies, sir." Unobtainium is that was the crux. That's why your movie didn't do better. Uh, you will probably be surprised how many people might agree with you that uh, he might not know how to make billion dollar billion dollar movies anymore. But I guess we'll see how uh, Avatar Two does. I guess it's true. It's true. But I think uh, I think with that we actually we could probably talk about random shit for the until the end of eternity. Um, we will end on our podcast is as good as on a Danium. We'll end on that. Yeah, our podcast is so hard to wait. No? <laughs> it's mystical. It's mystical. It's sci fantasy rammed right <laughs> in a place you can't get it, but it's perfect for your purposes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, perfect for your purposes. It's perfect for whatever and you a, need. A little, and a little, and a and a little hard to find. A little hard to find right now. A little hard to find. Incredibly hard to find. You know, I I actually thought about taking bets on to see if like Twitter would just bleed out so much money that they had to like shut it down, kind of thing. Um, but apparently Twitter still still exists. So, I mean, get your popcorn and we'll see how long that dumpster fire continues. So, <laughs> all right. So on, so, uh, on Twitter dumpster fires, then that's where we'll. So end. yeah, so so that's we're not going to end there. We're just going to say so. Find us on social. Find us on Twitter. Find us on Instagram. Find us on YouTube. Uh, we have the YouTube. YouTube up. Yeah, you can go. You can have us on YouTube, and then you can also, of course, email us if you want to uh, want to say hi or critique or just give us general hate or love. We prefer the uh, love. Don't tell Mike anything. why Avatar is the best movie ever. Yeah, tell tell me why that's that's the 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 first trillion dollar franchise now, uh, here 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 folks here's the challenge for you uh tell mike why avatar is better than dune go fuck yourself <laughs> <laughs> just just straight up stick that unobtainium right in an unobtainable location <laughs> can only hope somebody emails you a discourse on why Oh God, uh, <laughs> I'd hate to have to get into a debate about something so <laughs> stupid, but, um, 
I'm not going to defend my position. I've already won. But needless to say, you can hit <laughs> us at rollwiseguys at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, do you want to sign us off, buddy? Yeah, check all of our socials. And as always, uh, remember to roll wise and roll well. Yeah. So, and scene. There we go.